The Siege of Leningrad, a 900-day-old siege, happened during the Second World War and subjected the citizens of Leningrad to an appalling experience of starvation and death. During that time, one and a half million inhabitants of Leningrad died. I'm not here today to talk to you about the history of Leningrad. This is the terrible sort of story of those long, long siege when the Nazis had surrounded, encircled the city and bombarded it, attacked it with tanks and really left it, left the citizens to their own fate. I'm going to be talking to you today about a book by Helen Dunmore. Uh, she has written a book called The Siege on the Siege of Leningrad. And I think this is a fascinating book because it combines the history, the politics of that awful period. She distills it into 300 days between about the summer of 1941 and the spring summer of 1942. But especially, and I'll come on to this in a minute, she creates fictionally a family who endured the siege. Tragically, some didn't survive, but that story brings really the siege to sort of to a kind of real feeling of what they suffered. But if I start with the politics, I'd mention the length of the siege. Um, and I'll just read to you the chilling uh, indictment, the chilling message that Hitler um, wanted to be communicated to his forces. And he wrote this in September 1941. He said, the Fuhrer has decided to have Leningrad wiped from the face of the earth. That's what he wanted just starve them. He didn't want to support the population if they surrendered, but just starve them all to death, all of them. So that begins the book, and Helen Dunmore has put that as a little preface, and that is chilling. Hitler, the Nazis, don't really appear in the book. Um, we don't even see Stalin. Uh, he's there in the background. We do see some evidence of the terror, the reign of terror, the black vans that go around the city, uh, wipe, uh, sort of just capturing, sort of sweeping up the dissidents, and they'll be shot. Uh, but that's in the background, very much in the background. Uh, if you want to read more, just read what Stalin did after the siege was over. It's appalling. But Helen Dunmore concentrates on what happens there in the city in this period. Um, we do get a bit of the bombardments, because obviously we need to feel what they're enduring, uh, with the city being destroyed and some from outside. Um, we do see some evidence of Stalinism, the Communist Party, the loyalties. There are two minor figures. Uh, one's called Elisaveta Antonova. Uh, she's a primary school headmistress, but she's very much in the background, a very loyal party figure. There's another one that's a bit more strongly visualised called Fedya, who lives in the next door flat to the family. Again, party loyalist, uh, but he suffers by losing his child. So you do get the human consequences of Stalin's reign, which was brutal, even though fighting uh, the Germans, which, who were also brutal. The, the story, as I say, focuses on a family, a family of a father. The mother has died during childbirth, and her child, Collier, is five years old uh, during this period of the novel. Um, so we're left with the father, Mikhail, Mikhail Levin. He's a dissident, dissident writer. He, li he likes Pushkin. Uh, and he writes parts, what we see parts of his diary. And I think that's interesting to get the view of the sort of intellectual, uh, the creative side. He reads to his young child, we get a lot of flashbacks in the novel, to his young child Anna, who's the main figure. He reads her a story, an allegorical story, of General Winter and General Hunger, these two kind of personified figures representing these major forces which will really besiege the city, besiege the city. And he tells her that as a childhood sort of story, but it comes ominously real when that's what they suffer. Um, hunger and this appalling, it's the coldest winter of 1941 that they'd suffered for a long time. So those factors combine with no fuel and no food really just decimated the population. Um, so Mikhail is a fictional figure. Uh, there's another fictional figure um, called um, Marina, Marina Petronovna. Now she's an ex-lover, 
former lover of Mikhail. His wife has died, and during his marriage, she was his lover and actually was pregnant with his child, which she had aborted. Um, she comes, she moves into Leningrad, as a lot of people had to, out of the countryside, because that was, if you like, the safe place, ironically. So she moves in and like, moves in with the family. So they become, again, the reunited, reignited love, the older lovers. So there's Mikhail, the father, and then Marina, the sort of new older woman. So those two, the older ones, they're contrasted with Anya, the main heroine, and her soon-to-be lover called Andre, and I'll come on to him in a minute. But before I move on to look more at the fictional characters in the novel, I'd just like to mention two other minor characters who I think are fascinating, the way that Helen Dunmore weaves history into personal stories. And one of them is called Pavlov, and he was real. Uh, he was flown into Leningrad to manage the rations. And you get from time to time in the novel the lowering of the rations to, in the end, just a tiny few grams of bread, lowered and lowered and lowered. Central workers got slightly more than just ordinary civilians. So you get the sense of the party officials, the people trying to manage the situation. So I think that's fascinating. He's, he, doesn't get, he doesn't have a personal story beyond trying to manage the situation. In the end, he burns the figures of the dead. He burns the papers on which they're recorded because they're so appalling, they're so huge. Uh, that kind of record, he could, just can't uh, suffer. But there's one other sort of very much minor character that I find fascinating, and she has a real story. A bit like Anne Frank during the Second World War, the diary of Anne Frank. This girl, uh, Tanya Savicevi, uh, she wrote a diary which has survived. And I'd like to just read a bit from the diary. Um, and this is real. And she only has a tiny bit in the novel, and this is what she says. Um, in future entries, she will not underline the names. This is a name of a member of her family. She will record the deaths of her family one by one until they are all there. At the end, she'll write, the Savicevi are dead. They're all dead. Only Tanya is still here. And those are her actual words. Um, and I, I think they're chilling. She dies in the end from dysentery in 1944 um, when the siege is almost over. But all of her family, one by one, she records that, die. Um, so this 11-year-old girl, real figure in history. Pavlov, a real figure in history. I think that's fascinating. But let's come on to the family now. Um, now, I did say that, um, that Mikhail likes literature. He likes writing. And there's a tragedy in the fact that he can no longer write because he's not, he's not the favoured writer. He's not a party loyalist. He, he won't write what is demanded of him. So he's very much um, isolated, almost exiled. Um, he, he, can, he can no longer sort of survive by his work. But he likes Pushkin, one of the greatest Russian romantic poets. And if I just read you a little bit of Pushkin, um, here, he says this, I can recite page after page. I close my eyes and it's as if I had the book in front of me. I go through the section where Tatiana is lost in her dream. The plains, the fir trees, the ghostly light and the creak of her footsteps through the snow. All these come to me so powerfully that it's as if I'd never really read about them or thought about them before. I almost say aloud, that I'm sorry I didn't understand until now. My eyes fill with tears and I don't know why, but I know that it's by these things and nothing else that we survive. Poetry doesn't exist to make life beautiful. Poetry is life itself. And I think those references to Pushkin and his own thoughts on poetry and life really are almost at the heart of the novel. This is an account that at times is poetic in its treatment of love and the way human relationships endure. And, you know, it's that tragedy of the people that are recording it um, in the end sort of die, don't survive. Um, I mentioned his former lover, um, Marina, who's fascinating. Um, she, she's, she comes into Leningrad 
she cares for him because he joins up in the People's Volunteer Army. Um, and so you get the real sort of siege, you get the real events. Um, Anya goes off to help the fortifications. She does her bit. She was a nursery school teacher, but now she has to join the war effort. And he joins up, but he's too old, really. And he gets wounded, gets some shrapnel, ends up in hospital. He's writing his diary. And this is where the hospital and the diary makes a link, a very clever link, with Andre, who will become Anna's lover. Now, Marina, a dissident as well, like Mikhail, so Helen Dunmore kind of links those two figures, as well as lovers, they're dissidents. She's a former actress, but doesn't perform parts that are in favour. So again, she no longer works. Um, I think looking ahead to the end of the novel, he dies over a quite an a, a extensive period. He, he just literally fades away. But her death is almost not recorded. It's just one moment in the novel, she has kind of died. Almost before she dies, she gives the family something precious, which interestingly had been secreted away. She'd brought them in from the countryside, from her dacha, and the two pots of jam, uh, one raspberry and one cloudberry. And she secretes them away just to sort of hide them, to save them up for a rainy day, into Vera, who was Mikhail's former wife, into her felt boots, which I think is an amazing touch that those boots of his former wife act as the kind of lifesaver. And these two pots of jam she gives to the family soon, um, a few days before she dies. And those, if you like, are the lifeline. They savour them. Collier, the young boy, loves them. They treasure them. They haven't had jam for ages. What they eat in the end, and Pavlov coming back to the real figure, the political figure who, who allocates the rations, in his list, down the bottom of the list are these two um, things that they eat, the food. One of them is wallpaper paste and the other is leather. And after all the other things that, you know, any other uh, animals, cats, there are no uh, animals, domestic animals left in the city. Uh, they don't eat, 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 eat each other, but they eat wallpaper paste and uh, leather. So that's where they've got to. So now I'll come on to Anna, because she's the central character in the novel. I won't make a comparison to Anna Karenina, uh, who's a tragic, doomed figure. Um, but Anna is independent, she's passionate, she's unconventionally feminine, she joins the war effort, and she's a, a survivor. She gets from her father creativity, she draws people, she draws him in death, um, she draws a, a sort of a, a memento of him. So I think she's remarkable. Um, and I think I'd just like to read you a couple of bits on Anna. Uh, one is talking about the snow, which Leningrad, the winter, 1941. Um, and snow for Anna reminds her of a childhood when you go out sledging, go out ice skating. And this is the contrast that Helen Dunmore sets up between those kind of dream, the memories of snow and the reality of the winter of 1941. This is Anna. She looks up into the snow which spirals down the steep funnels of the sky whirls into her face, lands on her eyelashes and melts into tears. And then she goes back to the apartment, along streets where trams are already thrashing the new, soft snow into slush. Children skid around street corners, yelling, their faces blazing crimson. Soon it'll be time for skis and sledges. And tomorrow, when she wakes, the snow will be thick and crusted with ice. The sun will be out, and all the shadows will be blue. This is how she has welcomed the snow every day of her life. But not this year. The first snow falls on the 14th of October, drifting down through the sky and settling on the ruins of shelled houses, onto tank traps, machine gun nests, and heaps of rubble. The snow is silent, but ominous. No one knows this year whether it will be an enemy or a friend, the Russian winter defeated Napoleon, people say to one another. Perhaps it will defeat Hitler too. Of course it did. They lost, they lost, the Nazis lost a lot of troops in the encirclement of Leningrad, but that's the political side. So I think Anna's story is remarkable. Um, there's some other beautiful sequences in which she falls in love with Andre. He's a medic, a young medic, and that's the link. He works at the hospital, he comes across Mikhail's diary, and he needs to take it to Anna to return it to her father. So that's how they meet. 
And the love story is enacted very quickly, very passionately, very explicitly. Um, they talk about the dance, and the dance is a theme in the novel because it goes back to the past, goes back to the days of Leningrad, which are filled with pleasure and going out dancing. Mikhail danced with Vera, and now Anna dreams of dancing with Andre. Uh, but they can't because they, that's, those, those, are, those pleasures are no longer available. So I think those are fascinating kind of themes woven in to the love, major theme of the novel. There are two moments in the novel as well where Anna shows us her, her kind of strength, her determination. One is she buys a stove. She has to barter for it with some food. And uh, she, the, the hard bargain uh, is driven and um, she has to bring the stove home. And she's helped in this by a character called Evgenia. I haven't really mentioned her, but another minor character. Very strong. She's a woman. Um, she's uh, a worker. She survives by selling herself, her body. Anna survives by love of Andre, by love for her brother, and by caring for her family, by buying a stove. That's their source of life. Otherwise, they'll freeze to death. And then, second incident, where she goes to an abandoned house and uh, picks up some wood, because you know, somewhere in a the house there'll be wood but there are plenty of other women and people there scavenging. And she puts it on a sledge, any wood she's retrieved, and as she's coming out, she's attacked, and she loses what's on the sledge. And that's a, an awful moment where, if you like, the woman, the weaker woman is, you know, she has all those things taken away from her. Um, you know, those, that's the lifeline, the wood, but she's got the stove. Very, very important sort of, um, almost, image, symbol in the novel of their survival. Um, a lot of people die. I, I said one and a half million. And there's a couple, I'll just read you a couple of short bits on the children. And I think Helen Dunmore focuses very poignantly on the children who die. Uh, there are three of them. And I'll just very briefly, these are the three. Uh, a man passes her, passes Anna, pulling a sledge on which the starved contours of a human body poke through the sheet that covers it. One of the runners catches on a lump of ice and the sledge sticks. The man jerks it free. She sees what lies there with terrible clarity as if the man has stripped away the sheet. Forehead, nose, jaw, shallow breast, jutting ribs and pelvis. It's a child's body. The sledge runs lightly over the snow, bouncing a little. The second one um, is in the hospital. And just, just this, just two or three sentences. The little girl's name was Nadia. Ten minutes ago, he spoke her name into the bluish, shrunken face, although he already knew there was no calling her back. And that's Andre. And then one more, Zina, who is the wife of Fedia. I mentioned him, the party official, loyal. They lose her, their, their child. And this, so the previous one, a child in the hospital, Nadia, linked with Andre. This is a link with Anya, Anna. Just this. It is Zena with the baby in her arms. She stands in the doorway and holds him out to Anna, as she did before. I think he's ill. Do you think it's a cold or maybe an ear infection? The baby has been dead for at least three days, Anna judges, as she takes him into her own arms. So the mother's cradled, Tartar's baby, th three days, a dead baby. That's incredibly moving, just that. So I think, you know, the focusing on the, the children's deaths just brings it home. There are, there are others, if, you know, the whole po political story is all the dead left, left on the streets, but we don't see those. We focus on those. I've talked about women. I'll talk about two more things. Uh, the really salvation, how they survive. And I'll talk about one other minor figure called Vasya Sokolov. Now, Vasya appears at the beginning of the novel. He's a childhood friend of Anna. And they're playing, playing in a stream. They're damming up the stream. And she loses a hairpin. And she says, oh, Vasya, will you collect the hairpin out of the stream? So it's this lovely, innocent childhood game, almost like poo sticks. And then Helen Dunmore leaves him. And she brings him in later in the novel. 
and this is the point when she brings him in. The citizens survive the siege by the ice road. It's in winter, it's the Lake Lagoda that's iced over. They have to wait for the ice to thicken and they can bring the lorries over the lake. Uh, they lose hundreds of lorries because they go through the lake. Um, but that's their only lifeline. The rest of the city is encircled by the Nazi forces. So that's a real symbol of, of their survival. And Vassier's a driver. And his, um, his vehicle sort of breaks down. Um, it just says this um, about um, the, the sort of the journey across the lake. Um, he talked about his lorry. He says, this lorry's a bastard anyway. Something's been wrong with the steering all week. Vassier smashes his head down on the steering wheel. Don't play tricks with me, you fucker. People are getting shot for less. The lorry groans and heaves itself on over the rutted ice, slipping and sliding. Still dragging to the left. How far back was that repair station? A couple hundred metres? Could head back there. Now oh, go on, you bastard, don't fuck with me. And so on. And then the lorry in the end breaks down. He can fix it if he had a hairpin. That little bit of metal will enable the lorry to move and enable him to survive. And I just, at the very end, a couple of pages later, this is a little section. A hair grip, that's all he wants. What little girls wear to keep their hair back. They're always losing them and then their hair flops over their faces. Vassia, Vassia, can you see my hair grip? It's fallen in the water, I've got to find it. Who said that? And he's remembering Anna and their childhood games. And that's the last we ever see of him. And although he's a fictional character, you guess, did he survive? We don't know. Because that's the last we see of him, maybe he didn't survive. Plenty of drivers on that lake didn't survive. So I'll, I'll finish really with, if you like, the cyclical symbol in the novel, and that is of the city, because it is about the siege of a city and its inhabitants. And it begins in the summer of 1941, and begins with White Nights, that now St. Petersburg is noted for, and that part of northern Russia. And so it begins with this, a beautiful evocation, really, of the city in the summer. However old you are, you can't stay indoors on a night like this. It stirs again the promise and recklessness of White Nights. Peter's icy, blood-sodden marshes bear up the city like a swan, the swan's wings are still folded, but they're trembling in the summer night, stirring and getting ready to fly. Darkness scarcely touches them. And then at the end of the novel, we return, because we're back, we're, all, we're on to the summer of 1942, and the political, the reality goes that that was the worst winter, 41. Um, the supplies do get through, although they have to suffer another 600 days of the siege. But the novel ends with this, and it ends with Andre, Anna, and Collier. Mikhail's dead, Marina's dead, but these are the survivors. Three people <clears throat> stroll along the embankment close to Lieutenant Schmidt's bridge. The late sun strikes towards them, bouncing off the water so that they squint and shield their eyes. The man and woman walk close, touching at shoulder, hip and thigh. They're enlaced, lazy, only just keeping an eye on the little one, scooting along the curb ahead of them. Is a child a girl or a boy? The three of them are far off, and it's hard to tell. Suddenly they move into a bar of light reflecting up from the water. Broken, shivering pieces of light run up and down their bodies. They look as if they're dancing. Their mother father and child out for a walk on this beautiful May afternoon as Leningrad settles like a swan on the calmest of waters. But of course, they're not. And Helen Dunmore ends with, they're not mother and father, that's not their child. They're not given names, they're three figures. And an idyllic sort of family group, but it is summer, well, yeah, it is summer, but the siege is not over. So there's a sense of life there, 
of sort of renewal, of love really at the end. That in the beautiful image of the swan, St. Petersburg, the Leningrad will survive. Um, but they're just having a touch of downbeat, that almost irony, but of course they're not. And that's where the novel ends. It's a great novel. It's a great personal story, part reality, part fiction. But in the end, it's about love and survival.